Welcome back. Today we're looking again at Paradiso, and we're picking up in Canto 5, where we last left off as Beatrice was explaining about vows and about promises, and we were looking at those on the moon who had imperfect faith. In line 85, Beatrice ceases to speak, and shortly after that, they rise to the next planet, which is Mercury. And Dante says, Just as I am writing, thus did Beatrice speak. And then, still filled with longing, she turned to where the universe shines brightest. Her falling, silent, and her transformed look imposed a silence on my eager mind, which was already teeming with new questions." And we see, again, a similar sort of pattern that we've seen before, that Dante falls silent in front of Beatrice, although he has many questions. And most of the time, when he does have a question that she's going to answer, she's the one who actually interprets the question and he just sits there and sort of stares the question at her. But I also want to point out that it says, just as I am writing, thus did Beatrice speak. And so Dante takes on a particular role here, which is going to be kind of thematically important in this section. Dante is taking the position of Beatrice's scribe, which means that he is speaking on behalf of Beatrice, but he's using exactly her words, as though he has been given her words and then is reporting them forth to us. This mirrors the inspired writing of the Gospel writers who are writing through the Holy Spirit. And Dante's going to stretch that idea a little bit more on Mercury when we speak with Justinian, who also, according to Dante, is inspired. Now, he finds himself on Mercury so fast that he doesn't even realize he's been floating up, which is something that continues to happen. <clears throat> he describes it as an arrow that hits its target before the cord, the bowstring even ceases to shake. And as we've seen in the past, uh, when he looks at Beatrice, now that they are closer to God and on this new planet, she's even more beautiful than before. And her beauty even is imposed upon everything around her. He sees that the planet that she steps upon becomes more beautiful as she steps upon it, because her beauty radiates into it. And he assumes that he himself, even more so, being a very changeable kind of person, uh, radiates that beauty outward um, even more than the planet. And again, there's that image of reflection which we saw on the moon. As soon as we see the souls here, like the ones on the moon, uh, at first Dante mistook the ones on the moon for a reflection of himself or someone behind him. And here he sees uh, them as a reflective surface again, in this case a fish pond. But instead of mistaking them, he recognizes them for what they are as fish that draw close to what they see above them, believing it to be their food. So I saw more than a thousand splendors drawing towards us, and from each was heard, Oh, here is one who will increase our loves. Now that we're in paradise, as we've noted before, a love is perfected, and so all of these souls are, are gathering around, and by finding another soul to love, it increases their own love. And so each new soul that is added to their number um, just increases the love that is there. As these shades approached, each one of them seemed to be filled with joy, so brilliant was the light that shone with them. And one of them comes forward and says, O spirit born for bliss, whom grace allows to see the thrones of this eternal triumph before you leave the battlefield, we are on fire with a light that fills all heaven. And so, if you would like us to enlighten you, content yourself as you desire. They ask for his questions and say, O you soul who is able to see this beautiful rest before you finished the battle of life. You can ask us your questions and find out what it is that we have to teach you. And so uh, Beatrice reaffirms that and says, yeah, go ahead and talk. And so Dante asks the question, who are you and why are you here? What is the purpose here of Mercury? And as we noted right after the moon, we already noted that um, these first few planets, the moon, Mercury, and soon Venus, are places that are perfected but come from imperfection. So in the moon, we saw it as those who were just a little short on faith. And ultimately, they've received their reward, but they lacked faith at some point in their life. These are those who lacked hope at some point in their life. It's not harped on too much. The loved one's going to be more important once we get to Venus, but that's the, the virtue that is somewhat lacking here. After we get past the first three planets, we will get to the sun, and then we will no longer be lacking anything. And that leads us into Canto 6. And Canto 6 is very interesting. It's one of the, the cantos that is most often noted from Paradiso, because it is the clearest mirror between all three parts. In Canto 6 of Inferno, they talk about Florentine politics and the problem of Florentine politics. You might remember that with Chaco among the gluttons. Once they get to Purgatorio, they talk about Roman politics. And so finally, once we get here to Paradiso, the mirror 
passage talks about politics of empire. And so we've gone from Florence to Rome to the Roman um, Empire. And our speaker here is Justinian, one of the Roman emperors. And he is going to tell the story of Rome and the story of, as he describes it through the image of the eel that represents Rome. And he's going to do it kind of as a history lesson and a political lesson, but it's also a theological lesson, as we expect from a lot of things here in Paradiso. So the idea is that um, the overall empire, the political body, has theological implications. There's something that's being done religiously by the spread of Rome. So Justinian starts with Constantine moving the capital to Byzantium and renaming it Constantinople. And um, that's an important part of history, right? Because it's, it's a change of place of the capital. And he talks about that mov movement from west to east as a negative thing and a counterproductive thing. He says, for 200 years and more, the bird of God remained at Europe's borders near the mountains from which it first came forth. And uh, the bird of God there is the eagle. And the eagle is going to be his symbol for Rome, but it also has a lot more implications. And here he announces who he was. He says, Caesar I was and am Justinian. And that tense issue is something that we've seen a lot in our past examinations of Inferno and Purgatorio. The souls who are dead are no longer alive, and therefore they are no longer. We noted it particularly with Ugolino down in the bottom of Inferno, who says, I was Ugolino, and this is Fra Alberigo. And we pointed out the fact that now that these souls are dead, they usually refer to themselves in the past tense. Agolino's case, he was talking about his eternal undying hatred for that particular man. And so Justinian says, I was Caesar. My former role was emperor but I am Justinian. And so he still exists because now he's part of something eternal, being in paradise. And he is a citizen of heaven. So we have that idea of citizenship and empire and um, commitment to your allegiance in this particular thing. Now Justinian did something that was very important to Dante and to other people around his time period, and that was to put together all of the laws, all the rules and, and justice, and put it together in a book, and bind together all the law and all the explanation of the law. And Dante sees that as an inspired act, something that solidifies the empire and makes it more powerful, and therefore more capable of doing good. He almost sees it as a divinely inspired thing, like we were mentioning before. But Justinian also mentions that at one point he was a heretic, not believing that Jesus was human, only that he was divine. He only believed in one of the natures of Jesus, and he had to be straightened out by the Pope, because his hope was incomplete. But finally, after being perfected, Justinian was able to do the job that he had been set in place to do, which was to establish this body of law. And so doing, he handed the army off to one of his great commanders, Belisarius. So again, we see that same sort of uh, dichotomy that we've seen in the past at the end of Purgatorio, where there's the contemplative life, the life that is about ideas, and the active life. So Justinian was able to see the divide between those two and focus on the contemplative life, the life that was dedicated to writing law, while his perfect complement was able to protect and actively uh, take care of the country. But at this point, Justinian goes on an aside, which he takes some time to do. And it's not in direct answer to Dante's question about who you are and why you're here. It is an examination of the history of Rome. And he goes through all of the steps of Roman history, kind of mirroring uh, the Aeneid in a lot of ways. And it's interesting that the political section of the Aeneid is also section six, just like it is in all three parts of Dante's work. Aeneas, of course, is considered the founder of Rome, and Dante put a whole lot of love into Virgil in the last couple of books. Now this image of the founding of empire takes on other overtones, because it's not just a political thing anymore, it's something that's part of divine will. It's the idea that as the Roman Empire grows and is founded and is strengthened, that's the way things ought to be. Dante has a lot of patriotic love right here. And so he goes through um, all of the uh, establishment of Rome, he goes through all of the early kings and uh, things going on there, and then finally he gets to Caesar. And he goes through Caesar fairly elaborately. And this is interesting, Julius Caesar becomes sort of championed by Dante here, 
Uh, which is a little bit odd because Dante actually didn't like Julius Caesar that much as a figure. But here he sees him as something that was set in place by God to create a, a perfect situation. And there's that emphasis that by establishing the empire and by spreading the empire so much and, and solidifying it, he established the right conditions for um, the coming of Christ. And so he lists all of Julius's um, actions his uh, crossing the Rubicon, his triumph in Rome, his defeat of his enemies, which sometimes could be seen as treacherous. But here uh, we are seeing them as moments of victory, establishing, uh, establishing Julius Caesar as the first emperor. Okay, I know that some people talk about Augustus as the first emperor or Octavius, but um, in this particular case, Dante sees Julius as the first emperor. There's an interesting reference to Brutus and Cassius down there in hell. We've seen them before at the bottom of Inferno. And, uh, and here they're said, it's said that they bark in hell. For what it wrought with the one who bore it next, Brutus and Cassius bark in hell, and both Medina and Perugia are aggrieved. What came next makes Brutus and Cassius bark in hell. But that's interesting because they don't bark in hell, right? Because we saw down below, Brutus is silent in his stoicism. And Cassius, although he weeps, it doesn't actually say that he's barking. We have the examination of Cleopatra and her place, Ptolemy. Uh, and finally, we come to... <clears throat> okay, and so he comes to the coming of Christ, and he talks about how the empire was established just in time, uh, in the perfect time for the coming of Christ. And he goes on to talk about um, the crucifixion after this. He says, For the living justice that inspires me allowed it in the hand of him of whom I speak, the glory of the vengeance for his wrath. And now marvel at what I unfold for you. Afterwards it raced with Titus, doing vengeance upon the vengeance for the ancient sin. This is something that's going to bother Dante later, and he's going to actually have to ask Beatrice for clarification on this point. But what Justinian is saying is that the emperor who ruled at the time of Christ's crucifixion did justice by crucifying Christ, which is kind of awkward. And he does it through his median of Pilate. Now, why was it just to crucify Christ? Well, that's part of the big theological question here, that there had to be a crucifixion for Christianity to work. But also, he goes on to say that there was justice in the destruction of the temple through Titus. So we get a couple of what we would consider to be really bad emperors who are glorified a little bit by Justinian just because they played a key role in Christianity, in the events of Christianity. And so Justinian concludes his recap of Roman history uh, by actually skipping several years, but they're sort of the years that he covered earlier when he was talking about himself, uh, and concluding with Charlemagne as his great Roman emperor. And now he shifts to the problem of the eagle today, and that is the fact that the Gulfs and the Ghibellines, who we've seen so much of in Dante, who are tearing Italy apart, they are using this flag inappropriately. The Ghibellines have the eagle as their standard, and their corruption sullies the, the image of the eagle. And then we also have the gulfs who, instead of choosing the eagle, they reject it and they do the fleur-de-lis, the lily. Which kind of is shaped a little bit like an eagle, as noted by Hollander. <clears throat> but there's still that sense that their rejection and their corruption is doing also loads of harm to Italy. Both of these groups are inappropriately treating this great eagle, this great symbol of the body politic of Rome, but also the divine purpose of Rome um, throughout time. And then Justinian gets to the answer to Dante's other question, which is why we're on Mercury, and it says, this little star is ornamented with righteous spirits, those whose deeds were done for the honor and the glory that would follow. When such errant desire arises down there, then the rays of the one true love must rise with less intensity. But noting how our merit equals our reward is part of our happiness, because we see them being neither less nor more. So their pursuit of honor instead of their hope in the glory and honor of God uh, was what gave them a lesser planet, a lesser star. And as we saw with the moon, they're still very satisfied, in fact, perfectly satisfied with their position. And we already noted that they don't actually have to hang out on a separate planet. Um, this is just for Dante's instruction and his edification. Ultimately, all the souls are really floating around God. 
So much does living justice sweeten our affection, we cannot ever then take on the warp of wickedness. Differing voices make sweet music. Just so our differing ranks in this, our life, create sweet harmony among these wheels." And so Justinian is noting that although they have a lesser glory than some of the other souls, there is a harmony to their glory that adds to the overall song. And then he goes ahead and points out one particular person whose name is Romeo. This isn't the Romeo from Romeo and Juliet, so just banish that from your thoughts. Romeo was an advisor to a king, Raymond Berenger. And the king had four daughters, and Romeo found each of them a husband. And each of the husbands was also a king. So he was an excellent advisor to this king. Yet because of jealousy in the court, he ultimately had his name um, maligned, and he was thrown out into exile. We can see some mirrors to the story of Pierre de Lavigne. You remember how Pierre, back in Inferno, was um, treated inappropriately because of jealousy, and so because he put so much love into um, into his position and his his uh, relationship with the king, that he was devastated by the ruin of his name, and he committed suicide. And we see him crying down in hell. But here, Romeo is uh, the opposite side of that. He lived nobly and simply in exile, and he becomes something of an inspiration for the poet here, who is also going to have his name trashed, and is also going to be sent into exile for the rest of his life. So this is a, a figure who receives a lot of honor here from the Emperor Justinian. So in reverse of Pierre, who was maligned by an emperor, here's a man who is celebrated by an emperor. And he's not an emperor himself. He's just a lowly advisor who lost everything. And yet, his humility in that brings him great glory in this particular moment. And maybe sets things up for Dante's own ideas of exile, and how Dante himself will be glorified in his exile. <laughs> we will have to save Canto 8 for next time. Canto 8 is the end of Mercury and Beatrice's explanations of everything that Justinian said. So, until next time.